Okay. So the first bit is just to um, welcome everyone back because it's been a little while since we all got together. And um, thanks for your activity in the Google group. So the idea is that, yeah, everyone now who might have been invited here is in that Google group. Uh, there are some people who originally joined and then haven't since joined the Google group. So hopefully that's just because they don't want to. I hope we're not leaving anyone out. But anyway, whenever, if you want to pass on this, link that's totally fine people can join in and um but to be in the google group is best for people to be invited to the subsequent meetings and to be able to have some conversations so we've got um if you've clicked onto the agenda and the web page in the um meeting invitation otherwise i'll just put it here in the chat um, just following this along today, so uh, there's a link to the meeting notes for the previous ones if you're interested for subsequent perusal, or if you want to have a look at the meeting notes today, um, I'll put that link in the chat too, and then um, that's where we'll just be keeping notes going there, so feel free to contribute to that. We can see a few people in there already, and um, just make sure that people have edit access yeah everyone in this google group has edit access so let me know if you want to access it and you can't for any reason um okay so we have uh adam one of our chairs who's going to be kind of taking this is our new format now so we just got the main agenda framework and then our chair a nominated chair does um the the middle bit with um, mm -hmm. and organizers invites presenters who like to share information and um, we're very happy to have had presenters lined up so um, I'll hand over to Adam to take care of that bit. Hi everyone, um, welcome to this discussion um, in which we're going to talk about geo privacy. Um, I'm just going to paste the document that I've been assembling in chat that you can go and have a look at um, if you can't get to it uh, let us know in chat somewhere and we can work on the permissions for that. But it, it more or less just provides an abstract for each of the three speakers that we have today. So um, just by way of background, I thought this would be a good topic to raise in a, um, at the moment because we're seeing a lot of discussion in public around um, what means privacy and what means location privacy or geo privacy in the context of um, public safety and public health and data sharing. And it's something that I've had a, a fairly long term interest in, interested in having worked a long time ago for the Australian Library and Information Association and covered a lot of um, more general internet privacy ground there. And then a couple of years ago, co-authoring a, a book chapter on what means good data. And the idea of geo privacy popped up there as well in terms of um, what data do we want to keep private about ourselves and where we are and, and how can that be used or misused and also about a natural world, like what, what parts of, what natural and cultural assets are, are worth keeping private. Um, I'm just going to refer to the notes that I've written out. I was going to say, it was a long document. But um, from my point of view, it's, I'm, I'm not an active researcher in the field. So for this group, I figured it was best to, to get people along who work full time on this stuff and talk about what means geo privacy and what, what means um, uh, how, how we can put frameworks around it, um, some applications where we might or may not know our, our location data is being used and um, finally some active research projects. So our first speaker today is Michael Rigby who's a co-chair for this group. He's a spatial scientist and project manager with a background in design, engineering, managing the data and applications teams at the Oran Network based at the Uni of Melbourne and he's going to spend some time giving us key concepts around geo privacy and fr privacy frameworks um, and next speaker is john smilly who's not here yet so hopefully he turns up to 
Talk about a commercialized use case for our location data that we may or may not know exists. Um, John's an e-research systems analyst at the ARDC with a history as a developer and technical manager with the uh, National Computational Infrastructure, mm. UQ and CSIRO. And finally, our last talk today is from Peter Mitchell, a researcher in Queensland University of Technology's Digital Media Research Centre. We're with colleagues Marcus Froth and Marcus Rittenbush, who are also here, um, from QUT's Design Lab. is leading an ARC-funded project on location data, geo-privacy and everyday use of digital media. So um, Peter will talk to us about their work. And um, I only found this project very recently, so it's really interesting to have these people uh, have Peter and team come and talk to us about it. So we've got a little less time pressure than I thought we'd have. So what I thought we'd do is have our three presenters talk end to end and there'll be a little, little bit of time switching over and swapping screens and stuff. And while people are talking, please feel free to use the chat window for asking questions. And um, once our speakers are done, I'll try and keep them to their, their respective self-identified time limits. We can have a chat and try and um, walk through all of the questions that we give, uh, all of the questions that we get in chat. So, um, and if we don't get time to answer all of them, uh, we'll try and follow up by email later on. And um, just a final note, People sometimes get passionate about geo-privacy issues. Um, please try to respect that, that everyone has different viewpoints and um, there's plenty of space offline to have robust discussions, especially once um, coffee shops and other things open up. So, um, Michael, are you ready to share your screen and, and wade right in? Yeah, thanks, Adam. I'll just uh, get that up and running in a sec. Fantastic. Hopefully you can all see the screen. Um, yep. Background, um, I did my PhD a couple of years ago um, looking at um, intelligent mobility on demand. And I came across geo-privacy when I was looking at the movements of people through cities and particularly around their pickup and cloth locations. So I guess, I'm applying this at the moment really through R in, in a number of different ways, R as being my day job. Um, I'm actually looking at, well, what are some of the sensitivities around data and what are some of the techniques that are out there to, you know, um, protect privacy in different ways. Um, and the word protect, I use very loosely and I'll sort of touch on this stuff during the presentation. Okay. So I thought I'd start today with um, this question um, of, of why are people increasingly sharing their personal location information? Um, now, I guess the reason why I started off with this is because a lot of the, the, the geo-privacy literature has quite a long history, but it's really become a lot more pertinent um, as people are actually downloading a lot more apps, particularly for on-demand services, um, whether that's things like Uber Eats um, or things like um, Uber itself or other on-demand um, mobility applications um, and people really st starting to think about well you know I, I do really want to have access to services on demand I want things to come to me um, or I want to have better efficiency around different things um, and a lot of the new apps being developed are really trying to minimize um, I guess the number of clicks or buttons pressed, I guess, or, or touches on the screen, to really improve the user experience. Um, and in that user experience process, what we're seeing is that um, typically the location information is something which is provided upfront um, uh, in the agreement in the terms of use. And often this information may not be, um, I guess, aware to the user, but obviously it's in, in, it's in there in terms of the terms of use. So I guess we can, we can think of a number of different questions in this space, um, such as, you know, do you think about what you're giving away when you sign up to apps? Um, do you think about some of the trade-offs, like 
the information that you're providing when signing up to an app versus the benefit that you're receiving from that app. And then why do we care so much about um, the data that's about us and our privacy? Um, so I guess I'm gonna have a number of different questions throughout this quick presentation um, to sort of get people thinking about some of the different things because we're gonna to touch on this stuff a little bit later on. So I guess the Australian government's been aware of online privacy in a number of different ways for, for quite a while. Um, more recently through uh, the office, um, the Australian office, uh, the Information Commissioner in Canberra, but also the state-based um, commissioners around information and data. Um, so this is the Privacy Awareness Week, which was actually done earlier this week, sorry, earlier this month, um, which really sort of tried to educate people around the plethora of different devices that are out there, um, which are connected to accounts. And I guess a lot of this privacy does deal with every sort of day-to-day -day information which is shared in apps. Um, or some of this actually may have a location component as well. And I hope some of the slides which I'll share in a moment will also hopefully sort of unpack a little bit around that. So I guess we, starting off with a definition, um, like what is privacy? Now this is an old definition and I'm hoping that maybe Peta can actually um, improve on this one later on. But privacy being the claim of an individuals or groups or institutions to determine for themselves when, how, and to what extent information about them is communicated to others. And when we're looking at privacy, um, there are, it's great that we have commissioners in Australia now and doing lots of different things. This also does sort of come back to a lot of human rights aspects as well. And when we're looking at facts of geo-privacy, we're trying to put a definition around this, which is actually you know, quite contentious. Geo-location privacy is a type of information privacy that is then concerned with the actual location information of an individual, which I sort of pointed here as the app user, which may flow through a number of channels to third parties, understanding that information does flow from a device through to an inter internet provider, through a whole bunch of different infrastructure, out to other applications or third parties, which may feed into other different things. I guess the, the chain or supply chain and on-demand um, services are quite long. Um, and I guess this, this last thing is so while location information is, is personal related to an individual, it may or may not be deemed sensitive, sensitive or not. Um, for an on-demand uh, application to actually um, uh, deliver something to you, for example, the location information is pretty critical. Um, so in, in some aspects, um, we need to think about obviously what is the purpose of sharing the location information. So got some lots of questions today. So further questions, it's like, do you use methods to protect your identity when you're using some of these apps? Such as do you route apps through some extra services to hide, I guess, the source? Um, or do you employ other methods to hide your location information using these apps? Um, some people do like using a neighbor's address or one further down the street. Um, in my research, I was looking at, maybe you might put down the a street intersection nearby to you because that street intersection allows, I guess, multiple potential areas you could live in within, I guess, a neighborhood. Um, and I guess these methods of, I guess, we can come to a bit later on is more relating to a geo privacy model or some of the, um, the aspects we may use to hide things. But really this question of what is a geo privacy model is really big. Um, and researcher Maria Dieta, Maria Luisa Damiani, who I spoke to during my thesis, was looking at dividing this into three different areas, the privacy goal, the privacy mechanism, um, and the privacy metric. Now the privacy goal is looking at, well, okay, um, in an app, this may refer to the level of protection of a user's anonymity, whereas a geo-privacy goal may relate to the protection of the user's true location. Um, so we have this distinction between the privacy goal and the geo-privacy goal, and a further goal may relate to the user's movement behavior as well over time and space. So I guess when we start to unpack, I guess the different dimensions here, there's quite a lot going on. If we then move on to look at some of the privacy mechanisms employed by some of these apps, um, there are a number of different techniques. Um, and if we were to consider such a thing as location obfuscation or actually hiding your location behind something a little bit larger, um, from, a, I guess, a spatial perspective, we may look at, okay, let's map a point location to a region, such as an SA2. 
when looking at something like location perturbation. This is more about taking that point and shifting it randomly in X and Y, and sometimes Z, I guess as we're moving towards 3D cadastre, we may look at the Z dimension a little bit more. Um, location confusion is a little bit more abstract, but this is where we actually do create a dummy location. And you may have multiple dummy locations um, attached to you, and you, the actual app would bounce around between those locations, but only one of those is true. And the third one here is actually full location suppression. And this is where the location is absolutely blocked for some period of time. Um, when I guess the user is entering some sort of area or zone, whether that area or zone is everything or something specific. Um, this is related to what they call zone based privacy, where um, you actually may not um, share your location if it's around something sensitive. So with those ideas in, I guess, in the back of our minds, we then come to, I guess, questions around, well, you know, what are the legal aspects um, in Australia relating to privacy, location privacy? And there are a number of these. Um, and the app developers that are out there, or people who are releasing data or information, um, they're obviously looking at, well, okay, with the Privacy Act from 1988, which is a federal government, Commonwealth law at the top, and then underneath that, there's the state-based um, legislation. Um, in the Victoria, it's the uh, Privacy and Data Protection Act. Um, and there are other versions of these across the country. Um, so I guess the legal aspects of this, hopefully we'll get into a bit later on. We can sort of start to unpack some of the different things here and how we may, I guess, look at how well this privacy model and some of the mechanisms and whether or not that actually do satisfy some of the actual you know, things in the act. I um, don't know if probably have enough time to get onto the examples today because just consciously moving forward, but there have been a number of different, I guess, big, um, I guess, uh, examples of data privacy issues, particularly around geo um, privacy issues in recent history. Um, the, the most notable was the, the Medi Medicare Benefits Scheme or the MBS data release, um, where the government actually released 10% of the MBS data set and researchers at the University of Melbourne actually were able to dive into that and re-identify individuals from that. So whilst that may have employed some sort of location obfuscation or de-identification of, of, of actual individuals, they're actually able to re-identify that. And the same researchers did the same thing with the Mikey data set. The Mikey data set from Victoria was actually a data set which was released for a hackathon. And they were able to go into that and say, well, actually, I can see myself in this data. And based on seeing myself, I can then find someone else. And in these first two examples, um, what we actually saw was that if you had the, the primary, I guess, the, the, the primary de-identified data set, the one that was out there first, there are a number of different points that can be added, I guess, into the data mix in a particular geographic area, which allows re-identification to happen. And I guess, here we're looking at, I guess, what is the risk within privacy? And also in this case, we're looking at, I guess, what is the, the risk? And we're looking at risk of re-identification. Um, there may be risks associated with, say, um, physical harm or something like that if someone is actually tracking you. Um, which does come to the last item here, which I just put up on, on the slide, um, which is a recent one where there is a, quite a lot of research going into actually tracking people more around their behavior in cars. Um, now, obviously, when we initially I spoke about the trade-offs of location privacy and the benefit. Um, telematics in cars is presenting to be one, a really big one, uh, which is just happening at the moment, which is within the auto insurance industry, which uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to really collect and analyze the data about an individual um, to see the way they drive. So this isn't, their, I guess, their, their privacy, their geo-privacy, we're now looking at the behaviour within that as well, their movement behaviour. And once again, in order to sign up for, I guess, the discounted insurance or the better insurance, um, you actually have to do some sort of trading off between things. So um, I guess this leads to, I guess, some, some questions around, well, how might geo-privacy hinder the creation and open sharing of data? Um, and how might geo-privacy um, impact on ethics and the way mobile apps are designed? Um, and in the 
uh, Google Doc, um, you'll see something in there about the our Triple E eth Ethically Aligned Design Version 2 document, which is actually one of the leading um, ethical, I guess, design guides out there for mobile apps when it does touch on things like um, geo privacy. So that's pretty much it for me. Um, I will happy to take some questions offline, um, but hopefully you enjoyed that. I hope it's a bit of a primer for the rest of the discussion. So um, thanks, Adam. Yeah, thanks, Michael. That was really great. Um, I've just dumped a couple of questions in chat there, and um, feel free to keep adding more, and we'll, we'll get to them all later. Um, just a quick question before we move on to John. Is everyone able to see the... Um, Geo privacy document containing all the speaker abstracts or like topic discussions for today. Anyone not able to see it? Great. Okay, um, John, I saw you pop up earlier. You still, yeah, you are. I'm still there, Adam. Are you able to share your screen and, and get going? I'll give it a go. Great, thanks. Um, okay. um, Feel free to reintroduce yourself as well. Will do. Yep. So you can see a single slide there, hopefully. Yep. Um, so to reintroduce myself, uh, John Smiley from ARDC. So I'm a systems analyst with ARDC working across a range of different projects that ARDC invest, uh, invests in. Um, I'm by no means a GIS specialist or a privacy specialist for that matter, but um, I see a lot of uh, services that are both produced and consumed by projects um, across the whole sector that ARDC is involved in. And this um, this particular service, uh, I came across this particular service around the time Adam was um, putting together this um, geo privacy session and it seemed like it'd be a relevant example. It seemed, certainly raised some questions in my mind. Um, so this is a service called um, Cultural Location Insights. So it's offered up by a subsidiary of uh, uh, Telstra called Redify, which is a company that um, Telstra bought in 2016, uh, an analytics and um, development firm. Um, so what they're doing is uh, offering up services, offering up um, dashboards to clients, which give them an analytics platform into Telstra's uh, broadband, uh, mobile broadband, uh, sorry, mobile phone network. So just um, a bit of Googling, you know, depending on what statistics you believe, um, certainly it looks like you, you could believe that Telstra has a lot of data to draw on in this area. So um, something around 50% of the mobile phone market is, is stitched up by Telstra. And then according to Telstra's own figures, they're covering more than 99% of the population uh, by area and something around two and a half million square kilometers of, um, uh, uh, of, the, of the, the country. But certainly you'd expect they, you could believe they've got a lot of um, data to draw on in terms of tracking uh, individuals, mobile phone movements um, in real time. Um, so this is, it's not something you can, you can access just on the fly. This is something where you approach the company and, and, and from what I can gather from the website, you put, um, uh, you know, put your needs to them and they'll come up with a platform or, or a set of services which which de-identify and aggregate the um, data out of Telstra's mobile phone um, data uh, database. So straight off their website, they're offering up metrics like the origin and destinations of, of individual uh, of, of accounts of, of, of phones moving in and out of particular origins and destinations. They're offering up home locations, uh, dwell duration, the amount of time in the, you know, phones are spending in a particular place. Um, and they're suggesting that, you know, that example analysis might be looking for is obviously things like infrastructure planning, transport infrastructure would be, would be relevant and things like uh, large events, but also they've got one there tagged as behavior management. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but if you want to, want to if you're interested in, uh, you know, doing analysis of behavior, people's behavior, um, they um, offer up, a, well, they, they, would, they would offer up something to you. Um, and this is all down to 15 minute resolution. So it's fairly, um, fairly fine grown in, in the scheme of things in terms of individual movements. So um, 
that's what I was able to dig up about this this particular service just from a, you know 20 minutes or so of googling around and looking at the website. Um, but I thought um, there's some interesting things in there, some interesting points in there. Certainly, it's, it's, it seems to go right to the centre of geospatial uh, privacy issues. So, um, hopefully, that's a, if you want to investigate more, I can I can pass on some um, some links that I found. So that's that's what I've got on that one. All right. Um. Thank, thanks, John. As a Telstra customer, I'm pretty interested in checking out my TNCs to see if there's anything about that. Yeah, um, yeah. It, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a, it'll be really Yeah. And I have a couple of questions which I'll, I'll put in chat around that as well later for um, Michael and Peter to, to have a look at if they want. Um, I think let's Let's get Peter talking. Are you, are you happy to share your screen and get going? Fantastic. Thank I'm you. I'm mute as well. <laughs> and I'll share yep. screen. <laughs> Fantastic. Can everyone see that okay? Um, yes, yeah, so thanks to everyone uh, who's talked so far to, to Michael and John. It's been really, really fascinating. Um, so, it's, and, and it's really kind of set the uh, the, the context for the, the project I'm, I'm going to give a quick introduction to now, uh, which is very much focused on geo privacy, but very much coming from the perspective of everyday digital media users, uh, how they use location-based services and how they feel about sharing their location and the kinds of privacy trade-offs they make every day. And sort of setting this within a more, I guess, a political economy approach to understanding that location monetization industry and emerging um, policy and governance drivers around uh, geo-privacy. So the project, it's an Australian Research Council funded discovery project. Uh, that started in late 2018 uh, and um, and all the Australian based uh, members of the team are here at this meeting that's myself Marcus Fort and Marcus Rittenbrook uh, we also have international collaborators in the UK in Canada and the US uh, and these collaborators are across media studies geography and human computer interaction or HCI which is the sort of disciplinary spread of the project uh, so in this quick overview of the project, I'm just going to outline our findings so far. So coming out of a survey we conducted in the first year of the project last year, and I'll explain how we're starting to articulate these findings into a, a participatory approach uh, for designing for embodied location awareness. Um, just keeping an eye on my time. Um, so Here's just a, you know, no surprises here, just a representative sample of location-based apps and media showing how, just how pervasive location-based services and geomedia have become to everyday kind of navigation of our environment. Uh, and the growth of smartphone ownership has seen rapid developments in location-based services. And it's got to a point where it's now actually hard to find a recently developed app that doesn't request access to your location in some form, whether it's via GPS or it might be through Bluetooth as well. Uh, and even though, as we know, um, users must explicitly give consent uh, for their location to be uh, collected, particularly through GPS, uh, they may not understand, fully understand what data is being accessed with these permissions, how it's being used or who has access to it. Um, also, even though location monetization companies, and I'll talk briefly about these as well, that, that buy and on sell location data from apps, will regularly announce that they're only ever working with de-identified location data or, an, or anonymous location data. Uh, as we've already um, heard, there's something from Michael as well, there's something eminently re-identifiable about location data. Uh, so whether or not location data is directly connected to your, your personal name, uh, it's not hard to identify habitual and personally identifying sites from this data, such as a home or a workplace. Uh, so um, as I said in the abstract, it's made location both an important but also particularly sensitive data point, creating attention where uh, it's necessary uh, to share, it's essential to share geodata um, in everyday digital media use, but also extremely personal. Um, so this is 
uh, underscored by reports and surveys going back to 2016, like the European Commission, so, uh, Commission Location Privacy Report mentioned on this slide, which sees location data as a looming privacy concern for public administrations. And Pew Research going back to 2016 that found that location data is considered especially precious in the age of the smartphone and has a kind of special intimacy for the ind individual user. Uh, at the same time, location data has become big business. Location-based marketing is one of the few advertising sectors that's witnessed growth in recent years. And alongside this, we've seen uh, emergence of third-party location monetization companies like Sense360, Timo, Factual, and Cubic. Uh, so as digital media have become more location aware, uh, so too has the digital data economy, which is increasingly built upon this substratum of, of user-generated location data. Um, so over the last two years, we've also seen major international dailies uh, headlining reports into location data and breaches of public trust, like these from the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times in 2018. So these reports in turn have also uh, spurred a number of legal cases, including lawsuits against apps for deceptively obtaining location data, a major um, class action against telcos like AT&T and Sprint for on-selling user location data, and closer to home we've seen in the last six months the ACCC bringing a lawsuit against Google for misleading Android users um, about location privacy. So if these lawsuits are any indication, we're starting to see regulatory bodies uh, beginning to play kind of catch up over location data and geo privacy. So with that quick background then, the overarching aim of our broader project is to rethink what location awareness might mean in the age of spatial media and continuous geo surveillance. And our focus is on achieving this through uh, employing design approaches to build greater public awareness of geo privacy and towards a more public, a shared and public understanding of of the everyday politics of geodata and locative media. So while the aims of the project might generally align with a kind of digital literacy agenda, we're cautious about these predominantly uh, instrumentalist approaches to a deficit oh, model yeah. of, um, of location awareness. So to this end, the project, it's now in its second year, uh, blends kind of digital methods, digital ethnography and design-led human computer interaction or HCI methods to design for location awareness. So what I'm going to talk briefly about now are the findings from our first year survey of Australian smartphone users and finally speak to how this articulates to our developing participatory design phase that will engage participants across Australia to, to try to develop physical and digital interventions for location awareness. So in um, May, June last year, we conducted a survey of Australian um, smartphone users 13 years and older to kind of get a broader understanding of practices and attitudes towards location sharing across the country. It blended qualitative and quantitative elements, including a scenario that asked participants to choose whether or not to grant an app access to their location. So we had 270 respondents to the survey, uh, and you can find the, um, the, the report on our website if you're interested. So we, um, it, was, it was informed by an expanded version of the Technology Acceptance Model, or TAM. So this was originally, TAM was originally devised in the eight, 1980s. And the, the original formulation of it was that people would, um, would accept a technology or start using it um, based on two related uh, concepts. And they were usefulness and ease of use. And since then, this has been expanded because people have become aware that it's more it's more than just usefulness and ease of use. That means uh, that that, um, uh, that would encourage people to use a technology, and it's it, it, it's incorporated other um, other factors such as perceived risk. Uh, perceived trust, risk and control as well. And so this suggested a way for us to work through the kinds of privacy trade-offs people make between the usefulness of using location-based services. It, it makes things quicker in a lot of ways, but also the added risks and benefit, like the, the trade-off between risks and benefits. So uh, this is just a very, like you can see at a glance, the kind of demographics of the survey. I'm not going to go into this, but it's important to note that it was not a statistically representative survey. Uh, but the purpose of the survey wasn't to get a, a, rep a representative sample of Australia, but rather to try to elicit a broad range of responses to that question of location data sharing and privacy trade-offs. Um, 
to just to give you our main headline findings, we found uh, that respondents overall did consider usefulness to be the most important factor, uh, followed by control, privacy, trust and ease of use. So they were generally um, more willing to trade off their privacy for usefulness. Um, they also often suggested that sharing their location was the price they had to pay for access to these services. So people would say, you know, the ease of use sadly outweighs possible concerns around privacy, um, I must admit. So they would see this as being a necessary trade-off uh, and one that they were willing to make. Um, but uh, they, we did find that for, for people, there were key personal risks that overrode usefulness. And these related to surveillance or intrusive or unwanted marketing. Um, so people would find that, you know, loss of privacy was a, was a key risk, a key personal risk, um, as well as personal safety and security. Uh, so, and we would, we would have these, um, these responses that really uh, brought home some key issues. So um, this was a quote where uh, somebody said, our teenage daughter was being stalked and prior to us taking her mobile phone uh, from her, the stalker would turn up wherever she was. We changed her school twice and moved three times before we realized the phone was the problem. So we had some quite personal stories that people shared. Um, and so we also found that trust and trustworthiness were important in decision making around location sharing. We found this through the scenario that we that we used that um, that when people felt that they'd lost trust in an app that we might have been sharing their data in a way it didn't disclose, uh, people felt personally kind of violated by this. Um, and finally, we found people were ambivalent about location, highly ambivalent about location sharing. This word came up quite a bit. People would say, "I'm ambivalent." I'm not always aware of what the apps are doing. Ambivalent, I know that there's a trade-off. Um, while others shared stories that demonstrated this ambivalence, where they'd say, as a woman, um, location-based services can make me feel safer as I can share my Uber status. On the other hand, it can make me feel unsafe. Um, quite a number of mainly female respondents highlighted how geolocation as a technology made them feel both, at the same time, both um, at risk and safe. Um, so our survey respondents repeatedly pointed out the da daily negotiations that these apps required uh, to, main, to, to balance privacy and control. Um, and as I hope some of those quotes showed, uh, they were often emotionally or affectively charged. And this is in turn kind of mirrored by what our international co-researcher Agnieszka Lashinsky has termed platform affects. Um, so Geolocation has a kind of critical function in assembling trust within platforms. Uh, so when the uh, geospatial industry talks about trust and trustworthiness, it's inevitably about the trustworthiness of the location data in order to provide the critical function. But at the same time, geolocation works to affectively, affectively invest us as digital media users um, in platform ecosystems by assembling these affects of trust, despite the risks that we know, um, known and perceived um, associated with location sharing. So, um, because location sharing is so emotionally charged, um, the next phase of our project works more directly with everyday users of, of, um, uh, of location services to design for location awareness. Because of COVID-19, uh, we've had to rethink our approach to this since our original fieldwork design, which was meant to be happening now, would have had us traveling Australia right now to run co-design workshops across the country. Uh, so what we'll be doing instead in the coming months um, is digital ethnographic interviews with smartphone users around the country involving uh, design probes that elicit engagement and reflection on location sharing and geo privacy, which will then feed into co-design workshops next year which uh, when, when hopefully we'll be able to get um, people in in a room together uh, to develop a series of de design interventions for location awareness um, so I'll just leave it there if that's okay um, thanks Peter that was really great um, and thanks also Michael and John, um, I have a few questions dumped in the chat. Does, does anyone else want to ask a question of our speakers or add anything to this discussion? Otherwise, I'm just going to scroll up and walk through the questions I've written in. Um, 
All right, I'll go. So I think uh, Peter's outlined some some parts of my first question, which was, um, what do you see as risks for location data release? So unintended sharing of location data. And what have you seen in practice? So we've, we've had that example from people being stalked. Are there any other, um, any other impacts you've seen from location privacy being disrespected, I guess? Uh, yeah, I can provide a response. There's just, um, there's sometimes just general creepiness. So uh, why does my phone, like, why is my phone recommending me this stuff um, that's nearby? How does it know where I am? That kind of thing. But also, um, but also uh, unintended leaks of information as well. There was one in Australia just last year that was a, a family uh, family location check, kind of a family tracking app that was meant to be about keeping your family safe and secure. That was basically all this data was left on an unsecured um, server that you could uh, find if you knew where to look. Uh, and it had lots of information about kids in there, you know, and their location. So, yeah, so it, it's a kind of all levels from a general sense of creepiness to um, to just on selling of this data to, to marketing companies to um, hacks and leaks and these sorts of things, whether malicious or otherwise. Now, if somebody else wants to add to that, I've probably missed a few things. So I guess that ties neatly to my next que question, which Michael might be able to answer. Like what, once data's out there, what are the characteristics that lead it to be re readily re-identified? If there's any sort of specific things you can wrap a bow around. Yeah, um, so I guess one thing I probably should have clarified in my presentation was, um, I guess the, the preservation or the protection of the user's identity. And this relates to I guess common methods where they may be a, a pseudonym or some sort of code associated. And this, this often comes up in um, individual record-based data. Um, so these are the sorts of data sets the AIHW um, put out um, to researchers. Um, they're not out there publicly because um, uh, of the issues, um, but essentially if a, if a researcher has a project and they have a certain ethics statement in line, then they can actually apply for this data. now. Individual record um, data usually has a, a code, um, and that's sort of is there to preserve the user's identity. Um, obviously, at the back end, that code allows it to be linked across a whole bunch of other different data sets, um, which is, is very valuable for the federal government. Um, but I guess the, the first thing is to say we have this um, uh, anonymity or the way that the user's ident identity is actually anonymized. Um, the second thing is then around the actual um, the geo location itself. Um, and I guess that's where I guess we've, we're seeing uh, a lot of the new app stuff that, you know, Peta discussed as well. Um, the examples I provided around MBS and, um, the Mikey ones, they were more around, I guess, the risk of re-identification, which is really trying to figure out what, what that code or who that code relates to, um, rather than being uh, more of a location obfuscation or perturbation type process. So I guess we, we have the split between, I guess, the identity and the geo privacy component, but understand that the geo location can be used to infer an identity as well. So I guess we do have the two being linked. Um, maybe Petter would like to comment on, I guess, the link between the identity or the users, um, who they are, um, and their actual location and how there's a link between the two. Um, particularly when we're, when we're looking at this, I guess this concept, um, and I, I pasted a link in, in um, the geospatial um, capabilities practice notes for today around that only two data points are enough to help spot yourself in a record. And then as we start adding extra data in, things start unpacking from there. Yeah, and I think a, a, another um, critical point to add with, with this idea of continuous geo surveillance, it's not just spatial data, it's timestamps, it's geo, it, it's um, spatio temporal data. And once you have those two 
points together, you can get roots, right? And you can track people through time and space if you've got a, an identifier that, that links those data points, uh, which often you do, and that's how location-based marketing works. They can, um, so even if you're not identified by name, you can be identified by your habitual roots. And so if your data point goes back to a certain place, it's sort of six or seven o'clock every evening, you can be pretty certain that that's where somebody lives. And that's, so that's partly why it's so highly re-identifiable. Um, and I don't know if this helps to segue into a question about the GDPR. I, I did some kind of um, backwards tracing work with some of these location monetization companies looking at the, um, the internet archive to look at what their website said about what they did um, prior to GDPR and afterwards. And it was incredible how beforehand it was just like, this is the new oil, we've got all the data you want, to after GDPR, it's like, it's entirely anonymized and freely given, um, you know, with absolute consent, uh, this data. And it was just the, the shift in rhetoric, uh, but also knowing that that is not, uh, that might be uh, de-identified data, but it is by no means not re-identifiable. I'll probably do a link here back to the location insights stuff that John was talking about. Um, and this idea of um, aggregating data as well, um, which is, um, I guess, has always been in Australia. Um, we're talking about health records, um, an easy way to take sensitive data and just aggregate to a very high geographic um, unit, like an SA3 or an SA4. Um, because obviously it's smaller units and we're looking at rural and regional areas. You know, it's, you know, you can start to sort of see things. Um, now, the Telstra Location Insights product, from my understanding, is that they will aggregate the data set to a unit, which, you know, is obviously fit for purpose. Um, and now, as coming from the outside, we don't know what aggregated units um, other corporate people are getting, um, whether they're um, advertising firms or whatever it may be. Um, we actually don't know the granularity of, of the aggregations. Um, that's my understanding. Uh, yeah, thanks, Peter and Michael. Like, um, I spent a, a year and a bit working in a, a small defense-based startup that was looking at uh, location-based services and wrestled with a lot of these problems and decided that most of the time it's a really bad idea. Um, I'm seeing a few people from the Earth Observation community here as well. So, um, hang on, let's get to Kieran's question first. So, Kieran's just asked, what is the thinking on how to balance between the utility of providing location details versus the re-identifiability when multiple data sources are combined? So, how do we balance usefulness and uh, risk of re-identification? Yeah. I I, I think that's quite, it can be hard to do. And I think we see that with like con, um, contact tracing apps for coronavirus, right? So in certain countries early on, they tried to get out uh, location tracking apps and certain countries have done that. Poland, Israel tried to, but it got thrown out by their Supreme Court or something like that. Uh, and so we see in that, that location tracking would have sped up contact tracing radically it would have automated the process basically but it was not at all uh, palatable to the general public and th these tracing apps could only get be got through in certain jurisdictions or certain certain states um and 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 the the campaign that the australian government did to say that uh, that the covid safe app did not in any way track your location even though it potentially could through bluetooth uh was I think shows just how hard it is to balance those things um, where contact tracing could have been sped up so rapidly uh, through location tracking. Yeah, I don't know if that kind of answers the question or gives a recent um, critical case, uh, example. Okay, thanks. Um, I, th I think I'll just add um, the actual re-identification. There's a lot of uncertainty around that component. Um, when, well, my perspective is that when um, an organization wants to take a data set and make it open, um, the risk of it being re identified is actually blocking um, the release of the data um, because a lot of organizations don't have the capability to even look at 
technicalities of re-identifying a data set or to figure out well, what, what are the steps involved to make a data set, I guess, suitable for opening up. Um, here I'm talking about my experiences in, in the water and energy data space of um, the stuff that they were saying around, well, we've got this valuable data, but yeah, you know, we can't open any of that because, you know, once you throw in machine learning or AI in the mix plus future data sets, which may be utilized in the next five or 10 years, which can actually be pulled together, um, there's lots of risk there. And, and John, I don't know if you can speak to that, that Telstra data set uh, as, as well. Um, it's quite interesting that one of the, um, one of the the court ca or the the um, one of the legal things that I was talking about was based on enhanced 9/11 data, which was um, that all of these telcos in the U.S. were able to use, and they started on selling that data to um, to third party to third parties that weren't allowed to have it. Uh, but we've just brought this in to Australia, this um, this enhanced location for emergency services, and whether or not there's um, concerns around that with Telstra being able to on, then on sell this this kind of data as well. I, I don't know if you've got anything you can say about that. No, look, I don't, I don't really know. Look, I've only really looked at the, their website and what they, you know, which, which is obviously more a sales brochure than anything else. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's interesting. I wasn't actually even aware of that. So I'm very, I'm very interested to look into it too and see. Well, they've got a contact form. I mean, you know, yeah. you Hey, look, I'm interested in finding out everything about my neighbours. What can you do for me? Yeah. Got a question. I have a question. Me. Yeah. yeah. Um, just for clarification, are we only concerned about pr privacy of individuals or also uh, privacy concerns of data, location data concerns of companies? Because in Internet of Things will provide a deluge of data from, also from companies that they might not want to disclose, but just because these devices are located will give people information that the company might not want to disclose. Mm. Yeah, that, uh, speaking for myself, that, that's outside the scope of the project I'm working on, but yes, yeah. I mean, Certainly, there's this. Um, the, all of these these devices are very leaky, and there are risks both for individuals and for and for companies. Yeah. Um, in mineral resources, we looked at data pooling because there's a recognized benefit in pooling data that is, um, though, from a business perspective, sensitive for the companies contributing the data, and um, because of the spatial nature, we could show that obfuscation and, and or encryption is not possible mm. mathematically not possible um, so we then pivoted the project to look at it from the perspective of game theory to see under which circumstances is it beneficial for all stakeholders to pool their data mm. and I thought that was an interesting approach because it then looked at the this balance that we talked about under which circumstances is it good for me or under which circumstances should I not share my data and what did you find like what was the what were the ideal conditions that's a bit too complex for the last few minutes that we have <laughs> <laughs> and I would have to look at it again but it was there was no easy answer yeah. and it were quite <laughs> quite special conditions you see that again in precision agriculture and other uh, um, location-based services that um, to then it, everybody has to be happy. There's, mm -hmm. it, it's a consensus process. In the context of Jens example, there's also the infamous case where I think American soldiers using Fitbit leaked enough information that people could deduce the layout of army bases overseas just by measuring where they were running yeah, around. The, the Strava yeah, data the breach. Link, yeah, there's a link in the chat to that one. Yeah, yeah, this um, unintended um, security breach <laughs> through Strava, yeah. Yeah, so I just want to get to Rob Atkinson's question here. Um, is there any 
agency functional standards available for governments to manage those risks of data being re-identifiable? Yes, that was sort of getting back to Michael's comments about governments um, lacking uh, the capacity to be able to make those judgments and that's holding up data access. Um, is there any thought or movement or existing capability? Is there some place that, uh, that's resourced for them to go to to get that specialised expertise or is it just a, uh, uh, an open problem? I was going to say that um, I guess my experience is more working with the private sector. Um, I guess uh, looking at um, government, um, the peak body is obviously the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, as I mentioned before, but there are connections to others, as I said, at different, the next tier down at different states. Um, and technically, um, there's been a number of calls around how to do this and in victoria for example there's the victorian center for data insights um, they're one of the groups in the victorian government who actually <clears throat> take the data and help um, different groups handle it but my understanding is that um, they're very busy and um, yeah the questions um, can't get through fast enough but maybe peta has something else to add I, I don't have anything um, to add to that. It, it's, it's not something that I have, it's something I do have to look more into, um, but I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not entirely over that just yet. And, and yeah, the focus that I've had is how, our, um, you know, how, our, how our governance bodies responding to these, uh, to, to everyday you like, privacy issues around everyday users like the ACCC and, um, and Google Maps. But we're, we're, we are seeing this kind of flexing of, of um, legal muscle over, over location data, but I'm not conscious of, um, of a, a particular agency to uh, specifically around kind of re-identifiability of data yeah. uh, beyond um, what Michael already said. Yeah. Yeah, I think without that, they just they just fall back to the easiest example where they obfuscate to an aggregation level, which is, you know, very high and therefore, you know, unfortunately, not that useful for researchers in different ways. Okay, kind of makes sense, but tough. Um, all right, so we're we're one minute to go. So thanks everyone for coming, and thanks to our speakers for their, their great conversations, and Peter and Michael for some fantastic insight into geo privacy. Um, I just want to, no worries. Um, I just want to finish by touching back on Jens's, part of where Jens was going. Like what, what about the geo privacy of things that aren't particularly people who have smartphones? So something can, to consider offline um, in the age of continuous earth observation, um, you know, what, what about the right of cultural and natural assets to stay hidden from view but um we don't have time to discuss it right now so let's maybe hit the email list if you want to keep going and melanie are there any wrap-up things we need to do uh no just a reminder too to please participate in the group group um chat on all sorts of things tangential or whatever you want to say and um we do maintain that spreadsheet of resources and recommended presentations and outputs that we might want so that's linked to from the agenda as well so keep that in mind and yeah please we want to hear from you how we can um, continue and grow in directions that people are interested in thanks melanie all right thanks everyone thanks melanie okay cheers all thank you bye thank you, thank you. bye bye